Good afternoon, everyone. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith. And today I want to talk to you about uh, regarding John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11 is actually already in prison. And he's been put there by Herod, who didn't like what he said about it not being okay for him to John the Baptist's ministry <clears throat> began the greatest spiritual awakening in Jewish life in 400 years. Matthew chapter 3 tells us that the entire country of Judea was affected so that even the super superior Pharisees wanted to be part of this great movement of God. But interestingly enough, John was not fooled. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 3 verse 7, we read this, but when he, that is John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, which was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, he said to them, brood of vipers, that is, children of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Two different times, by the way. We'll talk about that another day. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now John was the final prophet of the Old Testament. He called the Jewish nation back to their spiritual roots, back to the law of Moses, back to following the truth, and so on. And John called for repentance in all levels of society, <clears throat> and his ministry penetrated to all levels, beginning at the bottom, actually, also touch the Roman soldiers because they're referenced in Luke chapter, Luke's chapter that deals with this, chapter 3. And his final call, his final call to repent and turn to God was to Herod. He told Herod that taking his brother Philip's wife was wrong, and he did so publicly. Herod had John arrested and thrown in prison, and when we next hear of John, he's asking Jesus, are you the coming one? Now John actually knew, and this is a very instructive piece of uh, the Bible, because you can know, you can be fully aware of the truth, and yet you can have your doubts when there's enough pressure. And John is alone, he's facing execution, his ministry is over, he doesn't have any prospects or any future, and he says, well, are you really the Messiah? Because, Jesus, if you were the Messiah, what's going on with me? So John's question was like this. It says, and when John had heard in prison about the works of the Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said they, through, through the disciples, he said to Jesus, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, go, tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he. Now, this is, the, this is the key statement. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. 
You see, John expected a different end. But God is sovereign. And he decided what John was going to experience. Now, John knew who Jesus was. He actually told several of his own disciples who and what Jesus was right after he baptized Jesus and the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. Most interesting from John chapter 1. And you need to read this yourself and think about it, not just read it with me. <clears throat> and it says they, the Pharisees, emissaries, ask John saying, why do you baptize if you're not the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? So the Pharisees really wondered who John was. And John responds, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Now these things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. Now this is after John had baptized him, just very little time after. And he said, this is he, excuse me. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now that is an amazing statement. John knew that Jesus would die for the sins of the world. That's the only way a lamb ever took away sin in Jewish culture. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Now, John did know Jesus in one sense. Jesus was John's cousin. <clears throat> and he came baptizing with water, and John bore witness, say, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. That's how John knew that Jesus is the Messiah. I did not know him, that is, I did not know he was the Messiah. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now this is what John said before he was imprisoned. He knew who Jesus is. But when you're in prison, you're facing execution, you're alone, and you have no prospects, and it seems like the end is right there, and you expected something different, you can start to doubt. And so that's the meaning of Jesus' statement, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So this is John, this is the reason for John's question. Are you the coming one? And Jesus answers somewhat cryptically, but John understood the answer very easily. He said, look at what's happening. John, just look. Listen to what your disciples tell you about me. There's healing, there's deliverance, there's preaching to the poor. And John knew that this was Jesus' word to him to call him to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. Religion in first century Judea was largely the province of the elite and the rich. You could be religious, but you were never accepted. If you were of the wrong social class, or if you were not wealthy, your faith was always suspect. In fact, the Pharisees said things like this in John chapter 7, verse 49. 
this crowd that does not know the law, in other words, hasn't studied it like we have, is cursed. <clears throat> John the Baptist's heart, as was Jesus' heart, always with the common folk and the poor. And like Jesus, John ministered to everyone. So the first thing Jesus says to John's disciples is, see what's happening. The second thing is, accept your own course of life and trust in me, whatever happens. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. You know, it's exceedingly hard to realize that God is not going to rescue you. Your ministry is finished. Your life is over. Nothing is going to happen that you thought would happen. And this is what Jesus is saying to John through the people he sent. And Jesus calls you and me to the same attitude. Your will, not mine, be done, O Lord. God is sovereign. And don't be offended with God. I have made some of the most terrible mistakes in my life by getting angry with God. He's God. He has the right because he is the sovereign. He is the king. He is the Lord. <clears throat> now, this counsel can be really hard to accept. But he is the Lord, not you or me. His will must come first. Now, John's life and ministry were over at this point. And Jesus now delivers John's eulogy. It's interesting to see that Jesus never spoke like this of that we have record of, of any other man or woman. Not Peter, not James, not anyone. To Jesus, John was the top of the heap. So here's the, here's the eulogy. As they, that is John's messengers, departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Certainly not that, because John was strong and stern. What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. And then Jesus says this amazing thing about John the Baptist. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah, that is, John is Elijah, who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So John the Baptist was the great one of the Old Testament prophets, but one, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater. John was great in the Old Testament economy, under the law. But now that the time of the New Testament is here, the status of the lowliest believer in Jesus is greater, not because of his accomplishments, but because of how he's favored to be part of God's free salvation. In other words, in a sense, you are greater than John the Baptist. Why? If you believe in Jesus Christ, you trust him as your Lord and Savior, you are part of the New Testament not of the old. And then secondly, 
Jesus said violent men attempt to force their way into the kingdom, but that kingdom can be only be entered one way. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 5, verse 24. It says, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. He shall not come into condemnation. He's passed from death into life. Or later in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Only Jesus is the path to the Father. Believing in Jesus Christ is the only way, no matter what sort of force you apply to the kingdom of God. All the prophets in the law, said Jesus, prophesied until John. <clears throat> and it's quite important to understand this because John was a transitional figure in John in God's plan. He was the one who baptized Jesus and the one who introduced him to the first disciples. He was the forerunner. After John, it was all Jesus Christ, the God-man, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and then, of course, the Holy Spirit sent to be Jesus' representative on earth. Now, if the Jews had been willing to see, receive, and understand, John was Elijah. But they rejected Jesus and took him, as Peter said, by wicked hands and crucified him. So he therefore was not Elijah. And the Jews still wait for their Elijah and will until they are willing to turn to Jesus as a nation. Zechariah in the Old Testament discusses this and tells us that the Jews will literally turn to Jesus in their extremity when they're facing awful, awful disaster. They will turn to Jesus as a nation, and there will be a nation born in, the, in a day, as one of the prophets says. <clears throat> and they will mourn over the deed their ancestors did when they crucified the Lord of glory. Here's what it says in Zechariah 12. God says to the Jews, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. They will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. They will weep over their sin in crucifying the Lord of glory. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning at Hadad Remon in the plain of Megiddo, and the land shall mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of Shimei by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. Folks, this day will be the day of the conversion of the Jewish nation in its entirety. And the day they enter into the full blessing of God, that time is yet future. However, while it's future for the Jews, you can receive that spirit of grace and supplications even now. You can call on the Lord and you can receive forgiveness of your sins. More than forgiveness, what the Bible calls remission, which is sending away of your sins so that they're separated from you as far as the east is from the west. You can receive everlasting life as your inheritance. And it's all free. You don't have to pay to get it. You don't have to do good deeds to get it. You just believe. So today is your day of salvation, if you will. And I hope you do. God bless you. 
and you have a wonderful day. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, signing off.